So joining the show, uh, former consultant to the Oakland A's for a very long time, uh, Eric Walker. Eric, thanks for being with the Sports Underground. My pleasure. Now, Eric, I just want you real quickly. I know a lot about you. I know who you are and what you've done, but I'm not sure that a lot of people do. Can you describe to me exactly what your role with the Oakland Athletics was in the 1980s? You know, it's difficult because I was never quite sure myself. (laughs) Uh, I had had a brief stint consulting for the San Francisco Giants. Um, I had sort of made myself into a baseball kind of analysis consultant, uh, I started probably in 1977 or so, which is about four years before Bill James' first book ever came out. The Giants were not at all receptive to this sort of thing. Uh, it's amazing to me that I ever got a contract with them. So when they had a shift in uh, management there, uh, I was my contract was let go, so I was looking for someplace else to go. So I wrote a letter to Sandy Alderson at the Oakland A's. Now, I only found out later, in fact, in some instances years later that Sandy was already well familiar with me because I had had at that time a five-minute module on KQED, which was the local uh, NPR station there, and it was affiliated to some other places, and my book had come out by then, uh, and he had read that. So I started off by doing, uh, as an introduction, a fairly brief review of the team for him using analytic methods, and that led to a contract, and I was with the team for many years through the rest of Sandy's term and through uh, the first several years of Billy Bean's term there. Now, I was sort of a secret weapon. Uh, It was not announced to anybody who I was or what I did. Uh, Some of the people there, especially in the later years in the front office, knew who I was, but I always reported directly to Sandy when he was there, and uh, our conversations were fairly private. And then every year I would deliver to him. Those were the good old days before computer analysis really became what it is today, I would deliver to him a box of printout, which was almost literally an entire full box of computer paper. The stack was probably 8, 10, 12 inches high, and we would talk about that periodically several times a year. Uh, As I say, in later years, I came to find that they actually, uh, they meaning Sandy in this case, actually did quite a bit based on the advice that I gave him and the numbers that gave him. You got to remember at that, that time, Sandy was himself a maverick. He was fighting an uphill battle because he was not a baseball man. He had come into it through the back door, so to speak. He was actually trained as an attorney, and he was originally the general counsel for the team. So when he became the general manager, all the old baseball guys were like, "Who is this guy? And where does he get off telling us how to do stuff?" So a lot of what he had to do with respect to using analysis, which was pretty much unheard of then, was kind of secret. He used it to form his own opinions and judgments, and then he went on uh, from there. When Billy Bean was hired as the assistant general manager, Billy knew nothing about any of this stuff. Sandy said to me, I'd like you to write up something for Billy to explain to him what we do, how we do it. And I ended up, uh, as a result of that, writing about a... 65 or 70 page paper called Winning Baseball that laid it all out. Uh, and I think Billy, when he was later talking to either Michael Lewis for Moneyball or Alan Schwartz for the numbers game, said it was like the scales fell from my eyes. That was when he first realized you could use logic and analysis to look at these things. So I'm basically the guy who taught Billy Bean, at least originally. That's my rule. So now I, I've I've read the book Moneyball. I, I have yet to see the film, but I, I'm definitely going to go out and see the film. Uh, in the book, this this 66 or 70 page analysis, winning baseball, it was referred to as a pamphlet. And that that did not best please me. There's much better <laughs> coverage uh, of my role with the A's in Alan Schwartz's book, The Numbers Game. Um, he spent a good deal of time looking into these things. Michael Lewis was kind of focused, and I was on the periphery of what he was focusing on. So he just sort of glossed over it. He was more interested in talking about Bill James because Bill James is a very well-known name. Who's Eric Walker? Well, Eric Walker is the guy that George F. Will once described in the New York Times as the most important baseball thinker you've never heard of, which probably remains accurate. So now let me ask you a question. Does it bother you that that you haven't been included in the book or, or in the movie? Does that Does that bother you? No, it really doesn't. As a matter of fact, in the original version of the movie, I was going to appear. By the original version, I mean when um, Steven Soderbergh was in charge of the project. He had a very different sort of movie in mind. It was 
going to be almost a quasi-documentary. It was going to be a movie about Billy Bean and the A's, but it was going to be intercut heavily with realities, with uh, interviews with various people who had known Billy uh, at various stages of his career through there. And uh, they flew me down to Hollywood, and I had about a half an hour on-camera interview with Soderbergh asking the questions. But then when Sony movies threw him off the project and decided they didn't like the direction it was going and uh, got new people in, the whole conception of the film changed, and I and a great number of other people, I guess, ended up on the cutting room floor. But no, it doesn't really bother me because my role was always secret in those days anyway, and it's the satisfaction of having done what I did that's more important. Uh, Deadspin approached me a few months back to write an article about it all, and I did. Um, and, you know, they say I tell it from your point of view, and I did. And I, a lot of rather crabby people posted after that, oh, this guy's just an old sore loser because he didn't become famous. Well, you know, that's really not the way of it, but chacun a son goût. <laughs> so let's, uh, you know, let's, t- I, I do know, I believe uh, Paul D. Podesta even asked that they didn't use his name in, in the film or his likeness in the film because uh, his words were that it was clearly a work of fiction. So I, I know you're not the only person from that era that that's not involved in the film for whatever salve that might be. Um, but talking a little bit more ab- about your analysis, uh, share with me how you came to, I, I mean, were you, were you just a longtime baseball fan that one day you decided like, Hey, let's do some math. It's almost a reader's digest kind of story. When I was a small kid living in New York growing up, the Giants were the family team. And I was interested, but I wasn't really uh, a sports fanatic. I mean, I, I did keep up a little album when I would cut out and paste the box scores every day. And I mean, I knew who Whitey Lockman was and all that stuff. But I wasn't really deeply into it. And as, by the time I got into probably even junior high school, I sort of drifted away from that and really wasn't at all interested in any sport for a long time. And then as it came about, my lady and I were living in San Francisco, and in 1976 or 7, I forget the exact year, there was a big rumor that the San Francisco Giants were going to be sold and they were going to be moved to, I think at that time it was Canada, there were other rumors, Florida, whatever. And I said to her, I said, you know, this looks like our last chance to go see this. This is fun. Let's go, let's go watch some baseball. Now, she was a, a more avid baseball fan than I was. She had been raised in uh, northern Virginia and was a fan of the old Washington Senators. And if you remember the old saying, Washington, first in war, first in peace, last in the American League. And uh, so I said, to her, let's do this. And we went to a game. It was really fun. We went to a few more games, and it was really fun. And I had been trained as an engineer, so the idea came to me. I said, there's got to be a way of figuring out how all this factors, which is more important. The guy, the guy gets more hits. The guy who gets more power. There was a big debate going on in those days. Rod Carew, is he overpaid because he's a single hitter and so on. So I said, you know, there's got to be some way of figuring these things out, weighing them off. And I said, I wonder if, there, if there's anything in the library about this. So I went down to the San Francisco General Library, and I looked for books, baseball analysis, and I found exactly one book. And I checked it out. It was a book called Percentage Baseball by a man named Earnshaw Cook. And if this is a Reader's Digest story, that's what a little light bulb appears above the head. Wow, I said, this is wonderful, because Cook was a professor uh, at Johns Hopkins, and he had gone into this very, very deeply. Now, the seeds had been sown, of course, back about 1950, when Branch Rickey had the guys from MIT come in and write him that famous baseball equation, so-called, which was the uh, cover article on Life magazine for one of the months in 1950. But nobody ever really did very much with it after that. Cook he put it off, and a great deal of what Cook wrote had some flaws, but he had the basic sound concepts very well down. So I started playing with this stuff, and this uh, this is, I guess, 1977, 78, and I got to what I thought was pretty good at analysis, and I began thinking to myself, you know, self, you ought to try and do something with this stuff. So I approached the San Francisco Giants, and I talked to a number of people there. This was the days when Tom Howard was the general manager, and Corey Bush was sort of in charge of things on behalf of the owner, Bob Lurie. And I talked to all of these people, and uh, it, you know, it was a difficult, it was an uphill slog, but I think what made the difference was uh, in the well, over the winter of, I guess it would be 1980, I turned in an analysis of the team predicting what they would do in 1981. Now, 1981 was a strike-shortened year, but if you take what I wrote and you prorate it out, it was stunningly accurate. 
it was, in fact, much more accurate as far as results than I really had any right to be, considering that there's always a certain amount of randomness in it. But I got lucky, and everything was pretty much right on. And they said, well, gee whiz, you know, if this guy can tell us ahead of time what we're going to do, well, you know, let's take a flyer on this. Uh, but it, still, it took a lot of selling. I went to spring training and pretty much every day harassed Tom Haller about it. And so uh, that's how I came to be a baseball analyst, completely self-taught. Bill James' first book didn't come out till I had already um, dealt with the Giants because I think that was 1981. He had some mimeograph copies before that, but he didn't even hit the market until 1981. So now let, let's talk about the moment. Let, let's talk about uh, – I, I want to I wanna find out, first of all, how did you – how did you test this system of analysis and uh, to make sure that it was working? And then can you describe for me the moment that you realized, hey, hey this really works? Well, I think it was plain all the way back there to Cook's book that this stuff worked fairly well. Uh, in my own book that I wrote in 1981, it was published in 1982, which was just a collection of essays on baseball, but one of them was about how you can do analysis. I pointed out that we're using no more than four common stats at bat, hit, total bases, walks, and one constant. You could predict with about 96, 97% accuracy how many runs a team would score or, or would have scored. I mean, you know, you, you began by developing retrospectively. You develop formulas that tell you what you think a team, a team scoring comes together from the various stats and you test it for accuracy against historically all the teams that have played and then you use it for uh, projecting to the future obviously when you project into the future you have variables that are beyond your control which are mainly playing time players get injured players get traded managers have their own particular wins how often you know should this guy play over that guy so when you're making a projection you have to make some assumptions about the amount of playing time people will get but it's really um it's been a science for 30 years or more. Uh, there, there's no, um, it's not like discovering television where somebody just one day said, ooh, let's do this. Now, and it's clear, I mean, obviously there's a significant amount of background for, for this type of analysis, but I, I guess with you know the movement of the so-called Moneyball movement in Oakland, this quickly, this type of analysis and this, style of putting together a team has quickly spread almost like wildfire through uh, Major League Baseball. Well, I think that's Have a there? little exaggeration because if you look today, you still find, you can find articles everywhere. Every day you find articles that tell you how this stuff is no longer important because everybody knows it, every team knows it, every team does it. But in point of fact, if you look at the numbers for every team, much just the numbers themselves, it'll tell you that, no, there's a lot of teams that just don't get it, as the saying goes. Uh, I'm blessed or cursed with following one of them. My lady is a big Giants fan, so we follow the Giants religiously. And that's very obviously a team that no matter how much they talk about how they do analysis, in point of fact, has no clue. In fact, Moneyball is kind of a misnomer for anything. Let's, let's begin with that. The Moneyball was a very cleverly chosen title of a book, a popular book. It's not the name of something that was going on. Um, the, the word I prefer is simply analysis. A lot of people like to use Sabre metrics that Bill James coined, but there are people not associated with Sabre, including myself, who do this sort of thing. And I prefer the simple term, analysis. When you apply analysis, that's why the title of the pamphlet, I, if you want to call it that, the paper that I gave Billy Bean was Winning Baseball. It starts from the beginning. What is the objective of a major league ball club? It's to win its division. How do you win its division? Well, there's a relation between runs scored and runs given up and games won. Here's how that works. Then what's the way you determine in which runs are going to be scored and runs are going to be yielded? And, you know, it's a strict logical analysis. And in the end, you use the principles there as a sort of a mesh or filter through which you run all the men in the majors and in the high minors to see who can help your team, who's a potential candidate, whether he's on your team or whether he's in another organization or what. Uh, and you use this. You say, well, what have I got now? What do I, where are the holes I need to fill? You know, it's, the, it's the basic principles only it's quant uh, of baseball always, only here it's quantified, so you don't make the mistake of thinking that a Dave Kingman or a Joe Carter is a really good ball player. The, the missing element on batting, 
know, through all the ages, was always walks, and to this hour, walks are still undervalued. I mean, if you look at Billy Bean's Oakland A's this year, they have the third worst on-base percentage. Their offense has the third worst on-base percentage in the league, and not surprisingly, they have the third worst offense in terms of scoring runs. Now, that is not a team whose offense is organized around analytic principles in the sense that I understood it when I was working with Sandy and that I was talking about to Billy in the early days. This is a team that is being organized on different principles, but they still call it all money ball, even though what goes under that term has completely, almost 180 degrees shifted uh, since the days when I was there, uh, which would be, what, uh, 95, oh, five, about 15, 17 years ago, something like that. Uh, I forget exactly which year it was that I moved out of California up here uh, to the boonies where I am and was no longer able to, to maintain a relation with them because of the distance. But it would have been somewhere around the middle 90s. And they have, they have just gone in a very different direction. And a lot of other teams, uh, what happened is they were seeded from the A's. If you look at how many general managers and other important front office people there are around baseball today who came up through the Oakland A's, in the um, in the 80s and the early 90s, there's quite a few of them. Paul Podesta is by no means the only one. There's, that's how this stuff kind of got out there and caught on. That coupled with the popularity of people like Bill James, but you know, James was probably representative of a fairly large class in a relative sense. Not a lot of people, but they were writing books. People who were actually working in front offices back in those early days, there were very few of us. Um, Eddie Epstein, uh, myself, Craig Wright, uh, and most of them, at least back then, were not particularly well known to the public. I think Craig Wright's the only guy who uh, wrote a book about his experiences, The Dime and the Praise. So there was a difference. There, the, the teams that had guys like us, and they didn't always pay attention to them either. Uh, I remember Eddie had a, a very difficult time when he was with Baltimore. Roland Heeman, general manager, they really just didn't understand what he was talking about. And then he finally went over uh, to one of the West Coast teams and had a little quiet success there, and then he moved on. So, um, so what when... Moneyball means is, is there, it doesn't mean anything. Fair enough. So with with the analysis that that we're talking about, is there do you, do you perceive that there's any like next step? Is there something new or you know perhaps something a little more nuanced or anything like that 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 is going to maybe cause a second revolution in this type of analysis of baseball? You know, actually, I don't. Um, I think that's part of the problem. The last several years. So much of the heavy lifting went on in the very early years. And because the basic principles are really pretty simple. Uh, the way runs are scored is you get on base and you drive the runners in. And if you look at most of the analytic formulas, uh, they really, basically, there's an on-base component and there's a, a multiplicative component that is supposed to be proportioned to driving people in. It can be as simple as total bases per plate appearance. So, uh, you know, when I can put together a little formula for my book that involves four variables and one constant and come out with 96 and 97 percent accuracy, that tells you you've captured everything in, the, in a very simple, straightforward way. I think the first step forward from that was analysis of pitching using the same tools. But that really wasn't so much a step forward in analysis as it was a step forward in the availability of data. At the time uh, I started with the Oakland A's, you could not find out how many doubles or triples a major league pitcher had given up from any record book then being published. Uh, that's how crude it all was. Uh, and then the idea of having all this stuff available for a quick download over the Internet, oh, my goodness, I remember the hours and hours and hours that myself and my lady spent every year when I was preparing my report for the A's, I would have type in stats off a mimeograph sheet of minor league stats, then I'd read them back to her and she'd cross check them with the written ones. I mean, tedious doesn't begin to cover the ground. So that was the next revolution, was the availability of a lot, a lot of data. But since that time, all we've been dealing with is refining. We've been going from like 90, 97% accuracy to 98% accuracy, and that's more or less literally. I mean, I don't mean that nothing useful has come out of it. A great deal has come out of it that is sort of useful. And baseball is a game of many, many little things that add up. But the big uh, jumps forward are mostly over. The only area that remains, and people have made more of it than they should from the amount of information that's really available, is fielding. People have said, okay, we understand batting very well. 
We understand pitching fairly well. What else can we look at? Well, we can look at fielding. But the problem is that the, the data isn't there, and there are were, there were all sorts of complications I won't explore now as to why it may never be there, even with this wonderfully super-duper uh, new uh, fielding FX that they're putting in there. They had the pilot run uh, at AT&T Park in San Francisco for the last year or two, and they're going to have just, it's just like the pitching data. You know, It's just amazing what they can see. But there are still philosophical issues with how well that can be used to measure fielding and what the relative importance of fielding is. So I don't think there's going to be any quantum leap in the state of the art uh, within our lifetimes, if ever. So I guess then the the question in reverse of that would be, are there any stats, any numbers? What I know that there, are, I for one have been saying that I thought batting average was a was an antiquated stat. I think I think largely errors are. Uh, are an antiquated stat in terms of looking at the entirety of baseball history. Um, these are just some of my opinions. In your opinion, are there any stats or are there any numbers that actually are are not effective or, or counterproductive towards the true analysis of, of baseball? Not really. It's a question of, of the fullness of your understanding. Stat people, analysis oriented people often tend to mock conventional uh, what, what what is called straw hat because uh, scouts who always wear straw hats to games what we call straw hat evaluation and straw hat evaluation is based on three numbers primarily batting average home runs and RBIs and the analyst realizes that RBIs are hardly any kind of measure at all of a man because they involve great numbers of things over which he has no control, no control. How many runners are going to be on in front of him? Where is he batting in the lineup? Things like that. Uh, it's like wins for pitchers. I mean, you know, look at Tim Lincecum. He's got a losing record for this season. He's, uh, he's 12 and 13. And yet the guy has a, a, an ERA barely over three and has been two for the last half of the season. So that doesn't tell you anything except that he, his offense doesn't do anything for him. Uh, so those conventional numbers, Batting average, uh, you know, it, it omits walks, which is an important part of getting on base. But the other side of the coin is you have to realize that if you look at a player and he's got a very high batting average and a lot of home runs and a lot of RBIs, he's probably a pretty good ball player. Not always. You get the Joe Carters and the Dave Kingmans, as I mentioned earlier, guys who take no walks at all, uh, and they're not anywhere near as valuable as is conventionally thought. So that's the kind of thing where there's a difference between the straw hat and the analysis guy. He says, but look at this. And you factor this in, you factor that in, his total worth as a, an offensive player is much lower than you think it is, and you can put a number so, on it. So fair enough. So I'm going to play devil's advocate, though, and I'm going to say, yeah, but Eric, if if I walk away from Joe Carter, I, I don't get the greatest one of the greatest moments in World Series history. Well, you don't know what you get because you don't know who you have there instead. You may get a greater moment. Um, you know, the thing is, and this is particularly visible in postseason, one of the biggest things that analysis people keep pounding on the table about that is a very hard message to get across is sample size. Because we're dealing with probabilistic analysis. It's the same thing as throwing dice or even simpler as tossing a coin. Everybody says when you toss a coin, you got a 50-50 chance of getting ahead. But they never analyze what that statement really means. If I sit down and I toss a coin ten times, am I guaranteed to get five heads? No, I am not. I could get seven heads. I could get ten heads. That would be unlikely, but nobody would say, oh, my God, I think the laws of the universe are wrong. I just got nine heads and ten tosses. That doesn't happen. On the other hand, if you went out and you tossed a coin 10,000 times and you got 9,000 heads, you'd say, whoa, baby, something's wrong here. This is not an honest coin. I know that this is deadly wrong. So it's sample size that's important. And in baseball, even a full season is, is really, for many things, not entirely as long a sample as you want. So when you talk about a guy comes up and he does this and he does that, you know, that doesn't mean anything. You, you, we forget how very, very fine are the distinctions we make with numbers in baseball. If you have two everyday players, you know, not bench guys, not scrubs, not subs, but guys who are out there, Every day in the lineup. And one guy's a 260 hitter, and the other guy's a 300 hitter. And you say, 
Wow, that's a pretty big difference. What What is that difference? One hit a week. 300 hitter gets one hit a week more than a 260 hitter when they're both playing every day. So what are you going to get if you don't have Joe Carter? Are you going to get the same moment? Are you going to get a better moment, a different moment? You really don't know because it's like tossing a coin five times. You don't know what you're going to get. But when you're building for a season, when you're going through that 162-game stretch to try and get to the division, then having a guy who's got a little better number helps you a little bit. Having a guy with a lot better number helps a lot. And if you don't have those true numbers, what the guy's true offensive value is, then you're just back to straw hat standards or the good old days of scouts. Well, he's got good face. Believe it or not, that's how, until fairly recently, and for all I know in some organizations still, that's how ball players are evaluated by scouts. Good face. He looks good in a uniform. He looks like a ball player. Oh, my, oh, my. So uh, this you mentioned something that, that kind of reminded me something I wanted to talk to you about. I, I, I've been a fan of the game of baseball for a very long time. Uh, I feel like baseball at this point is being distanced uh, by football and in some ways even basketball in the national consciousness. And I mostly think it's just because our attention span has grown so much shorter as a nation. Uh, I, I just I, I'm not sure that that baseball as it has existed is going to continue to exist in this country. And, and one of the things that I've said that I think would would help baseball a lot would be if they would shorten the season by one month. Just start the postseason in September as opposed to starting it in October, and suddenly you're not going up against football. You, you know, you're you're capturing the nation's attention in a time when there's you know kind of a vacuum of of things happening in sports. And I genuinely think that it would just be better for the game of baseball. Statistically, what impact do you think there would be if the baseball season was to be shortened by one month? Well, not a lot, because you already by the time you hit 100 games or so, uh, say the All-Star break or a little past it, you've already got a pretty good evaluation of who's good and who's not. Um, yeah, you can have these rapid breakdowns or sudden runs by team at the end of the season, but by and large, it wouldn't really affect the probability of the season selecting the best team. The uh, the game, yeah, I think it runs too long. Too many of these other sports seem to have 13-month seasons, which, which uh, is very bizarre. You no longer talk about the summer game, the fall game, the winter game. Uh, th- those concepts are gone forever. But the reason none of this is likely to change in our, in our, our foreseeable future is dollars. There's been a big, big shift, even within living memory, what's just do with baseball and what's going on in baseball. And that shift is in the nature of ownership. Not very long ago, as these things go, maybe 40 years ago, um, most baseball teams were owned by an individual. They were owned by an individual who typically made his money somewhere else, but he was the guy. He was the top of it. Now, I'm not saying far from it that people like that didn't care about money. You don't get to be rich enough to buy a ball club unless you care a great deal about money. And they cared about money with respect to their ball clubs. But the reason they bought the ball club was not to make money. There were better ways to make a return on the amount of money that used to be involved in a ball club even back then uh, than to sink it into that kind of enterprise. They did it for ego, and for ego they wanted their clubs to win. They had an interest in the continuing quality of the sport of baseball. And this is especially true with what we have really, really lost, and that is the family whose entire business was baseball. Somebody like Bill Vett, somebody like the O'Malley's that owned the Dodgers. When those people were driven out of baseball by the rising costs, uh, and we ended up with corporate ownerships, uh, somebody that imports bananas or that or the makes computers or, or whatever as the ownership of a ball club as a side enterprise uh, because somebody on the board is interested in it. You have a completely different attitude toward what it's all about. The attitude becomes what I want to do is make money. And if they're going to win games, they're only going to win games because somebody in their office decided that maybe that will make us more money. There are clubs out there 
that are perfectly happy to chug along winning 75 games a season because that brings enough bodies through the turnstile for them to make money. And if they spent any more money winning 80 games or 81 games or 85 games, it wouldn't be worth it to them for the extra amount of, of fan they bring in. The cost would be greater than the revenue. That's the way they look at it. Not in the old days, like the owner said, I don't care, I want my team to win. So part of that is the ridiculously expanded season. Part of that is all these breakdowns into divisions. And the reason that nobody wants their team to be effectively out of it by the middle of the season because then the fans won't come in. I'm telling you, the next stage is going to be 31 team divisions. Everybody's a division winner, and we have a 170 game postseason. Yeah, and they've already they're already talking about expanding uh, the playoffs by a additional wild card team, which only goes further to. Uh, to demonstrate that, and I, I think to me that seems especially unfair because, as as you've talked about and as I've read things that you've said, the postseason in baseball is largely, I mean, it's largely a crapshoot. I mean, yeah, the it, phrase it, I used to it, Billy is the phrase he used to the press, and it's now the standard way of describing that. And yeah, it's correct. Uh, you can't learn enough about a ball club in seven games or even in nine games. Nine games would be better, not because the number of games increases your chances, but because of the, the way you have to play. Uh, in a seven-game series, you don't have to worry who your fifth starter was. That doesn't represent how your team played through the season. You had five starters going through the season. But um, my, you know, everybody always says expansion, expansion. After all, Back in the good old days, the United States had half the population it does now, so you had two teams, uh, two leagues rather, of eight teams each, and, you know, the country's twice the size. Now, well, yeah, all right, I, I'm willing to live with 28 or even 30 teams, but four divisions. Four divisions is all we should really have. And uh, let them meet once to, de- to determine a pennant winner and once to determine the World Series winner. And for the love of Mike, let's get rid of interleague play. That really, really corrupts the entire game. Because the entire wonder and joy of the World Series was these teams had never met before in the regular season. There was no measurable way. There was no measurable way to determine how they were going to do. Month and say, well, yeah, but the Dodgers could beat the Yankees any time, blah, blah, blah. And it wasn't until you got out there in the World Series that you could see it. Now, you look back, and, they, you know, they've met ten times during the season, and their record is this and that, and what's the point of it? You know what, that's a, that's a great point, and I, I've hated interleague play for quite some time, but I, I, I had not thought of that angle, so that's a very interesting point. So I'm, 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 Gonna just, I'll let you off the hook after this, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you a question. I know that there's no, there's no really statistical way, I don't believe, of predicting, you know, the World Series winner, uh, in our current system because, like you said, the sample size and everything. Right now, today, September, uh, 26th, we're about, uh, a week away from the end of the regular season. Who's your pick to win the World Series this year? No, I do not pick. I know too. There's a famous old saying: "Gamblers don't gamble." Um, I know too much about it to to make a pick. Uh, contradictory as that sounds, I mean, the more you know about it, the more you realize that in a series of at maximum 19 games and and, and maybe as few as 11 games, you, it really doesn't matter. I mean, you could you could throw one of the worst teams in baseball into there, and they'd have almost as good a chance of winning as one of the best teams does. The differences are altogether too small to make any meaningful prediction at all. Uh, it, it, that's just how it is. You might just as well go out there and toss coins. And in point of fact, if you look back at the history of postseason play, if you sit down and you figure what are the probabilities, of, if you assume each team was a penny that I was tossing, I mean each game was a penny I was tossing to see who comes out, and you look at the historical distribution of wins, uh, how many wins have there been in a, in a Sweep. How many wins have been in there? Uh, you know, four, four and three, and this, that. They exactly match what you would have expected to get by tossing coins. So it is, in the true literal sense of the word, a toss-up. So, do you have any ability to step away? I, I know, I know you you do this a lot. That you, you you're very focused on the numbers. Do you have any ability to step away from that and and just look at the va- at the at the game from a from a fan's perspective, like I really like this team, and I think they're going to win. I got a hunch, or or is it literally all just numbers to you? Is that is it 
Is it? Is no, it the like game is more... not all just numbers. Uh, in the sense that I mean, I watch every game the Giants play all year. I probably watch 160 because once or twice a year, somehow we're going to set the timer wrong out on the recorder. But basically, watch every game the Giants play. And, you know, there's a lot of ups and downs in watching any team 162 games a year. But you don't normally look at it and say, well, you know, what the numbers are. What you look at is you look for the, for the fine play, the fine at bat. But, you know, you also, you think the numbers because when you see, here's player X comes to the plate, say this guy is a really fine hitter. He knows where the strike zone is. He'll take a walk if they give him a walk. And you see the guy have a fine at bat and you feel satisfied. Player B comes to the plate and you know player B hasn't got a clue where the strike zone is. He'll, he'll swing at things in the other batter box. And sure enough, you watch him do that. And that's very satisfying to see people behaving as you have expected them to behave, at least in the long run. And you have favorites. You see the guy the struggling shortstop with a great glove, who's never going to be able to hit over the Mendoza line. And you see the guy hits a grand slam, and you think to yourself, good for him. He may never get another chance to play in the majors after this year, but, boy, he's got that to look. You know, there's a lot of emotion. That's why we watch the game. That's why the game is so wonderful, is because we can tie our emotions into it. I mean, it, it's symbolic in so many ways. It works on so many levels. Uh, the, the scale of time is perfect, because at the short end, we're talking about milliseconds, as fast as the human nervous system can respond to something. Batter's got maybe 50 milliseconds to make up his mind whether or not he's going to swing at this pitch. But that's within the human scale. That's an eye blink. That's about as short a time span as a human can deal with as a human without instrumentation. On the other end of the scale, baseball is a thing of generations. Your father took you to the games. Your grandfather took you to the games. Your grandfather took your father to the games. It's intergenerational. That's as long a time scale as is meaningful within the human life. So baseball just exactly covers that span of meaningfulness of time to the human being. And, you know, here's another thing about it. It is a metaphor for the American way of life as opposed to that in certain other countries. Other countries, if you look at Japanese baseball, it's all the group. They play the game. They approach the game differently. In this country, baseball reflects our view of life. It's a team environment, but each person is doing a different job. The excellence with which they do the job helps the team. You don't get promoted from first base to second base because you're a better hitter. You, you have your particular job, and you do your job. In another thing, it's a psychological microcosm. We all live in a world that is extremely unfair, where we get screwed left and right at work, in love life, in everything you can think of. Baseball is a neat, regular universe bounded by a pair of white lines and an outfield fence. There are four guys down there in blue who are imperfect, but their role is to see that everything goes by the rules. And the things you achieve, you achieve by the talent you exhibit there. It's it's the idealized world where things work the way they're supposed to. It's a wonderful game. That's great. Thanks so much for your time. You've been very generous. Our guest has been Eric Walker, a longtime analyst and clearly a lover of the game of baseball. Uh, thanks for being with us, Eric. My pleasure, sir. Thank you.